Please welcome the great Sir Ben Kingsley. Yes, sir. Good to see. Bounding up the steps. Welcome. Robot Overlords, you play Robin Smythe. Now, can you describe the character and would you consider him to be the villain of the piece? Well, he's one of the survivors of the piece and everybody under the extraordinary constraint of being occupied by an alien force mm -hmm. all have to survive somehow by compromising, by trying to keep avenues of communication open between them, by trying to hold their family together in the absence of one or two, uh, one of the key parents. Um, I, don't see, I don't see him as a villain because I never judge my character. Uh, but I do completely concur with the great writer and the director in that there has to be, um, in the great myth that we're presenting, there has to be a wizard, a dragon, a princess, a prince, and they're all in our film. Yes. Although it's an ultra-modern, fantastically uh, technically adept film, yes. it has its roots in what I call pure mythology, and therefore... Um, Rather than judge him morally, I just say I play the wizard, the one who is between the occupying dragons, who are the robots, and the civilian population, who are the, who are the downtrodden people who live in the towns. Fantastic. So, so is it the character that attracts you when you start looking at a script, or do you look at the whole package, the director, the writer, the locations, everything? Definitely you look at the whole package, um, but at the same time, if you can find your corner of the film can be fully occupied, by a character that I can give to the camera, present, then it's very exciting. You know, uh, as, as, um, as Harrison Ford said when I worked with him a couple of years ago, he said, I just like to be useful <laughs> and on set. And I do, I love to, be, I love to find my place in, this, in the narrative, how to serve the film, how best to tell the story, and where I fit in that story. And I was completely clear as to where Robin Smythe fits in the story and what his, uh, what I call it, I call it his uh, narrative function, what, what he has to bring to the young hero, what force does he have to bring for the young hero to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's an old saying amongst, well it's not a saying, but, but uh, script, people who read scripts for a living, sometimes they know that a script isn't for them in the first 10 pages. When do you know a script is for you? Probably the first two, okay. in that um, Usually, um, you know, the, the writer, director, producer set out their wares in the first two pages because many films are now created to grab the audience's attention in the first two pages uh, or first two minutes of the film. And in a sense, they, they lay out their wares so you can see as a member of the audience in the film or a, a script reader as I am, w what the essential characteristics of the story are and therefore, unfortunately, it can be all laid out in the first two pages and it's a no. Uh, or, uh, if, it's, if it's really intriguing and doesn't lay itself bare in the first two pages. I was reading a script, I am reading one now, and page 11, page 12, page 13, page 14, but I was so intrigued by what was going on and it completely stood itself on its head by the end of the screenplay. Absolutely thrilling. I'm going to do it. In fact, I'm going to help produce it and make sure it's done. It's beautiful. So again, it's that point, page 11, page 12. I'm still reading this, so yes, okay. I'm, exactly. I'm, yeah, I might yeah. produce this. Yeah. That's very yeah. interesting. But with this movie, with the Robot Overlords, you have a very interesting entrance as well. Did that, did that catch your eye? Reading you mean, it on the page. You mean past your bedtime? <laughs> that one. Yeah, no, just when, we, when, we, yeah, when he first turns up when Robin first uh, appears on screen, which we're about to see in a clip. Well, um, he, he first appears on screen to be saving the life of a child, but it turns out that his only motive for saving that child's life is that he will have control over even more people's destiny than, than before that fortunate accident takes place. So you see him um, as a, civilian, a member of the civilian occupied population but as one who can communicate directly with the dragons, as I call them, the robots, the occupying forces. We, do we have a clip? We have a clip. Let's take a Great. look at the, uh, the wizard. And I think I heard a boo. 
<laughs> more of a whoop. A whoop. Oh, no. Surely a whoop. No, it was a boo. Tell me and a And then whoop. a hiss. <laughs> As all the villains deserve. <laughs> He's, he's just uh, allowed that boy to return home. That boy has just been completely traumatized yeah. by seeing his parent, his father, killed by one of the dragons, one of the robots. Um, so that it's a very manipulative act on my part. I would say, without judging him too harshly, that Robin Smythe does survive by manipulating history and the people around him. But how much, about the, how much of the character do you know at that point? You're maybe two, three pages into the script. He's just arrived on, on screen, he's just said a few words. How much of the character do you know at that point? Only, only what I know on page two. Uh, I have to go through the whole arc of the character uh, from beginning to end to appreciate his journey and then to appreciate why the wonderful director and writer want me to have that particular arc to therefore illuminate and celebrate the arc of the young hero. I mean, I, I do mean I'm there to be useful to that arc. Yes. Um, and I can enjoy my place making, making the hero look wonderful by being as, uh, as dark and complex and sinister and threatening a force as possible. Uh, I mean, if the dragon's weak, then the knight that kills him is, is not a great knight. Uh, so to go back to the original mythology, Absolutely. you have to make these, these dark forces really um, thrilling and, and perplexing to an audience in order for the young hero to triumph. It's, the, it's what makes all great storytelling last and uh, it has lasted for hundreds of years. It's the, those wonderful elemental features of the film. Um, we, we just spoke for another, uh, for another podcast and uh, you described your method, uh, your approach to acting as forensic. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I, th I think I use the word forensic because when I was at school um, I had vague and rather inaccurate aspirations to be a doctor because my father was a GP and my elder brother went into medicine and I thought that I would j trot along. I think it was to try and please them rather than yeah. follow a real um, vocation. However, I, I did have the pleasure of going to a good school where I learnt, uh, was taught physics, chemistry and biology. And I, I didn't exactly excel in them, but I appreciated them and I enjoyed them. And I, I now enjoy the scientific study, the forensic study of a character and his behavior, his cause and effects. Why is he like that? Rather than how is he like that? Um, I think all the best Shakespeare productions of Richard III um, are those that show why Richard is like that not how he is yes. but why he is yes. they are they are the ones that are really for me entertaining and, and enthralling so my my forensic search is to say what is the inner wound in this character that drives him forward i think with robin smythe and i'm thinking aloud now because i've not had this thought before i think it's rejection rejection mm -hmm. romantic rejection i no. i think rejection from his pupils at school uh -huh. um and not being the, 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 the great demi demigod uh, that he wanted to be um, uh, to his pupils, but a rather ridiculed pedagogue. And I think that that, um, that wound, that rejection in him taints and affects everything. You know, his, his first marriage, his uh, fa infatuation with, with, um, with, with, with the mother of, of, of Sean. Played by Gillian Anderson in the in the film, yeah. absolutely. So th that's that's very interesting. Who again, wouldn't in be infatuated of, by? Who wouldn't be? Uh, Obviously, we've got another clip Gillian coming Anderson up as well. Could play a rabbit, and I'd be <laughs> totally infatuated by. Um, I, I'm intrigued by your approach to acting. I'm sure there are a lot of people here who either want to be actors or are starting out as actors, and might be intrigued. Do you do you keep notebooks? Do you keep journals? Do you write things down? Do you sketch ideas for how your character might look and sound? How do you go about doing it? You find, you'll find, it, 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 um, if you come across an old script of mine, you'll find uh, notes in the corner, in the margins. Mm -hmm. You'll find certain key words underlined. And um, I get this from having been blessed with at least 15 years as a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company. That's a long time. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's yeah. what an apprenticeship. It doesn't exist now. Yeah. They, the turnover is far too quickly, far too fast. I started out 
as a walk-on understudy. If I'm very lucky, I got on, I carried a spear, um, and I and I worked through the ranks of that glorious company and played Hamlet, mm -hmm. Brutus and Julius Caesar, Othello in Othello, um, Demetrius and Peter Brook's famous Midsummer Night's Dream, wow. Ariel in the Tempest. Uh, so those 15 years uh, were absolutely indispensable to my love of language, of dramatic literature, of history, my stamina as a performer uh, on stage eight shows a week. I would not have been capable, remotely capable, of performing Mahatma Gandhi without my 15 years training in the Royal Shakespeare Company. Wow. And it was Michael Attenborough, Dickie's son, who saw my Hamlet and said, Dad, if ever you get the money, that's your, that's your, there's your Gandhi. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So they're inseparable. Yeah. So from that training comes a, a, a desire to document. Well, I say training, but let me let me reaffirm that the Royal Shakespeare Company is not a drama school. It's a very hard-working company, uh, and and you develop through the ranks, and you work with great directors, and and there are voice coaches, movement coaches. Uh, sword fencing coaches and classes. You can avail yourself to all of them as a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, or you can go to the pub. <laughs> it's your choice. I availed myself of everything and went to the pub. I had the best of both worlds. Busy guy. I like it. So with Robin, uh, there's a particular accent. Uh, there's a particular appearance. He wears a baseball cap and a bow tie, which is a strange combination. Uh, can you talk about that, that decision? Well, um, I chose his accent because of uh, certain uh, elders that I was acquainted with when my father was a GP in Salford in Lancashire, and and therefore the there were there were certain people with 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 aspirations of all of all kinds that were suffering from rejection of one kind or another, and you could detect it in their voice and in their inflections. It was a kind of earnestness and confidence but under, underpinned by terrible pleading and insecurity and, and the bow tie was my pupils will respect me and the baseball cap is but I'm really one of your I'm one of you really <laughs> so that so there's a total mess of statements he's trying to give off to the world fantastic uh, actually you, you mentioned the the writer and director are here today and uh, Mark Stay and John Ryder over there hello Japs hello give him a round of applause everybody um, <laughs> John asked me to uh, ask you something. Um, Robin, throughout the film, <laughs> wipes his nose with a handkerchief. Yes. Why does he do that? Because he thinks it's posh. I think his mother told him, wipe your nose. And I think it's stuck. Yeah. Instead of, he, I think as a child he did this. He was bashed about the head violently by one of his parents and, and a handkerchief thrust into his hand. So I'm afraid it's conditioning. I'm being posh. I'm pleading my mum. Look, mummy, I'm being posh. And the, the what a wounded man Robin he is. He is. He is. Lots, lots of open wounds. And one of which is his relationship with uh, Julian Anderson's character, Kate. I don't know if you can talk about that. We have a clip coming up where uh, he's trying to persuade her to join him. I think it's purely carnal. I think he fancies her rotten. <laughs> and I'm afraid you can't go much deeper than that. Or more primal. Indeed. Shall we, uh, shall we see a clip of Sir Ben? He's rejected. Fancy and Gillian Anderson? It, well, <laughs> don't give it away, don't give it away. Let's take a look at the clip. Get if you join me there. You see, I think what happened with Robin is that he did have fascist leanings. Yeah. When he speaks about overpopulation and pollution, I, it doesn't have the Green Party ring to it. <laughs> he, would, he, he would say, you know, you've got to actually cull yes. nature yes. viciously. Uh, in order, you, you cope with an overpopulated and overpolluted world by killing people. Mm -hmm. And that the dragons, the robots, have come up with the perfect solution for our planet, which is to get rid of people. So it's a terrible extrapolation of what already was latent in him as some kind of fascist cleansing of the world. And lo and behold, they come. He's glowing in that scene. That has to be the most uh, sinister use of the word fecund I've ever heard on, on film. Erotic, I think, Erotic. is the word you're looking for. Well, that's why I've crossed my legs. Um, I'd say, let's go to you guys now in the audience. If you have any questions for oh, Sir no. Ben. <laughs>
please put your hands up. We have uh, some Roby microphones going around. Well, both being uh, an actor and a producer, um, with companies like Amazon and Netflix, for example, moving in and starting to change the, the funding and distribution model, uh, has that impacted how you consider projects? And if so, uh, what excites you about that change in the dynamic? I think we do live in very exciting times, sir. You're absolutely right to point that out. Um, for some years, uh, my company, Lavender Pictures, have been nurturing a project along and we thought that it would be ide make an ideal cinema experience. Uh, the, the, the material is of an historic, profoundly historic nature. And I think amongst us we realized, and it was triggered by a question asked at one of our last meetings by one of our close colleagues. And we realized that I've just finished a mini-series about Tutankhamun. We filmed it in um, Morocco. And the extras, the set, never mind the writing and the direction. The script was beautiful. Six hours of television. And the production values that were brought, I saw trailers from it recently in New York. The production values that were brought to that miniseries were of on a par with Ridley Scott's Exodus, which I was in which I was also. So I had this great comparison between Sir Ridley's film and then going to Morocco to make a six-hour television series. In terms of the um, budget and the working hours, I would say that there was more of a constraint on the miniseries in the number of hours we had to work. Um, it s s bled into a six-day week. Uh, we got a huge amount of foot footage in a reasonably short space of time. Uh, but it was very well prepped. It was perfectly cast, and as I say, the design and landscape on which we worked was flawless. Ancient Egypt, built in Morocco, really beautiful. <laughs> so I am very excited by the shift uh, in our audience potential, in a variety of style, in, in the opportunities open to actors, the tremendous amount of work now open to actors with all these extraordinary studios, really, um, mushrooming brilliantly so that we have uh, made tentative steps towards moving our aspirations for a big movie on this historical epic into a six-hour miniseries so we've been directly affected by it yes and it's very exciting that's where we have our audience now for great historical drama and more and more or should I say less and less interrupted by commercials so it's having an effect on those who make TV commercials and produce TV commercials, I think more and more now you're finding that your great companies uh, and brands are sponsoring short films of 9 to 12 minutes in length and the product is never used. Let's say it was a, a whiskey brand and you'll never see anyone drink a glass of whiskey. It will be about something else, but it'll be presented by... Um, if I mention the name, will I get a crate of whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead. Sponsored by... <laughs> <laughs> um, My favorite but, whiskey. You know, you, th that, that's, so that your lack of TV commercials has pushed those sponsors into dropping your commercial break and making beautiful short films or sponsoring whole shows. So it's a, a very exciting shift. Uh, any more questions for Sir Ben? There's one right over here. Um, how does your research differ going in from playing real-life characters to playing fictional characters? Um, I think that, in, in, of course, the advantage of some historical characters that I've played is that they are photographed, even recorded, and some even on film. And, and one of the greatest privileges I had when I played Simon Wiesenthal, the famous Nazi hunter, was to spend hours with, 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 with Simon in, in Vienna and in Budapest in Hungary and he was like a father to me, it was deeply inspiring. But to answer your question, what I think I will return to is the word forensic, that if I can find, because a great historical character from truth can be badly written and badly interpreted and you don't have that wonderful forensic balance of cause and effect that you'll find in a great script. So that um, in portraying Don Logan in Sexy Beast, who is a completely fictitious character, 
my forensic search led me to find that, I hope I'm answering your question, I think I am, that my forensic search, I think your, your word is research, mine is a forensic search or a hunt, it's like hunting. My trigger for playing Don Logan in Sexy Beast was that Don was an abused child who will therefore go on to abuse others until he is healed. He will never be healed. Uh, those adolescent and childish childhood years are too far behind him now for that epiphany of healing to happen. So he will compulsively go on to abuse others, rather like the handkerchief in the hand of Robin Smythe from our blame his mum. But but then at the same time you get a factual character. Let me go to the other end of the scale with, with uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And my trigger for him was implicit in the screenplay and I didn't realize this had happened until I saw it in the screenplay and then did some further research and of course it was true. It was a big mistake to throw that man off a train. Big mistake. Of all the people in the world to do it with, you did it to that young lawyer, you will pay a terrible price for that. So my central gesture as Gandhi was one of anger and indignation, not of gentleness and peace because those, his uh, Satyagraha force was driven by ferocious anger. And one of the most gratifying things I heard after the film was open was from a colleague of mine, an actor, saying, you know, that was one of the angriest performances I've ever seen on screen. So he'd seen that gesture, that pain of being thrown off a train for being, um, what did he call him, a kafir, and threw him off the train for being in a, in a non-white compartment if I can put it that bluntly. And, and that was my search for what was the fuel, the radioactive fuel that kept that man fighting and alive for all those years, it was being thrown off a train. I wonder if he'd met a kind <laughs> ticket collector on that train <laughs> in South Africa. Maybe nothing would ever have happened. Isn't it strange? But I look for cause and effect. And it can come from history. It can come from fact, but if the screenplay is well enough constructed, I'll find it in there. We've got you. time for just two more questions. Uh, if it, there's a gentleman right here at the back. Thank you. If you just keep your hand up so the lady can see you. Thank you. While working on a film, um, how do you approach the relationship with a director? I mean, how do you consider that uh, creative process between the two? I think that um, I have and am continually blessed by working with directors with whom I can freely collaborate. I think the, that the, the greatest gift a director can bring to the set is to create a, a, a tight context, a ring, a playing field with rules and limits in which the actor can flourish. Um, I think my collaborative mandate with a director would be from the great um, mathematician Archimedes, who used to work with levers and fulcrums. And Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and I'll move the world. It's the most brilliant saying. And, and I, I know it, was, it applied to levers and fulcrums and mathematics, and if you put, you put your energy in the right place, you can move anything. But I, I also have a, have a tacit bond with the director. Uh, if you give me a place to stand, I'll move the world. And with Scorsese, with Attenborough, with Spielberg, um, with our John Wright, they have, they have given the actors the most perfect place to stand. In, in that I mean that the camera is in the right place to capture the narrative gestures that the actor has so carefully nurtured and presented to the camera uh, that the film set is, is beautifully governed and respectful, um, uh, that everything, uh, your costume and, 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 and everything that you're given as accoutrements to your performance serves the narrative. So that I, I think that my, my real connections with directors uh, have been absolutely collaborative. And I think many, many of the the kindest things that directors have said to me have been have been in the guise of surprise when they have said, "I never saw I never saw that scene that way, I never heard that line that way." Um, 
one example, I don't know whether you've seen a film called The House of Sand and Fog. Uh, when I um, am on my knees praying after the death of my son, the director, Vadim Perlman, had written me screaming into the room. And I said to Vadim, I whisper it. I whisper it on my knees in all humility. I don't scream or shout. The, the grief comes through such a mercilessly narrow aperture that I can only whisper. That's all I have left after my son's death. After a tiny bit of arm wrestling, he said, I never saw it that way, but my goodness, it's you're, you're right. And he filmed it, and um, it worked brilliantly. May I, have we got time for one more quick example? Absolutely. Have you seen the film Sexy Beast? I have, yes. The great confrontation between myself and Ray Winston when I say yes, 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 originally was to take place in a room much larger than the space we're all gathered in together now, a huge sitting room in this villa. And I felt that it was a, a domestic quarrel between Ray's character and mine, almost like a lover's quarrel. And they take place in kitchens. They always take place in the domestic heart of the building. They don't take place in, in grand foyers or they're in kitchens. So John, Jonathan, took everything down. All the, every, the lighting, cameras, took everything down. Lost half a day's shooting and put everything in the kitchen and shot it there. <laughs> and it works. Those knives, those stainless steel, it's a merciless stainless steel kitchen. The other room was comfortable. So there's two examples of uh, the director not seeing it that way, but we being able to offer something and actually them shifting, literally shifting their perspective. Amazing. Uh, I read somewhere that Shane Black on Iron Man 3 persuaded you to be in the film by sending you a letter. Is that true? And oh, it, yes, a beautiful letter. Is that how to get Sir Ben Kingsley into your film? But just send a letter? No, as, as no. As that? Script. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Script. Okay. But was that the only time this happened? Did someone no, send you a letter? I, 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 I often get now get a letter accompanying the, uh, the script, but with great respect, uh, I read the letter out of, out of politeness and courtesy, but it has to be the script. It really does. No matter you know, how much they would love you to be in their film or not, uh, it ha the test is, is the script and whether or not I can, I can find that, as we were discussing, that, that essential trigger that will power me through the story. Uh, we have time for one last, wow, lots of hands went up there. Um, can you ask the same questions at the same time? <laughs> There's a lady there and a gentleman there. Um, my question is going to be that um, there is a criticism within modern cinema and modern television shows that a lot of times, because you know we're very nostalgic, we like things from you know the 80s and to some extent, Robot Overlord seem a little nostalgic of you know the sort of Transformers series. Um, there is a criticism that in that because of the nostalgia, there is a loss of original ideas within that, within the scripts that you're getting now more than say when you first started in your career, do you reckon that sort of stands true or do you reckon that now, particularly in the age of the internet with easier access to filmmaking and all the rest of it and more opportunities for actors, um, is there more originality now or is it sort of just, I don't know, inconsistent, I guess? Um, well, my, you, you can appreciate that I wish I had a broader knowledge of current writing um, of the, th the company that I'm helping to run, I'm running, uh, only has six screenplays on its slate. Um, but I do, for my taste, I tend to resist the formula and let the film have its own logic. So it doesn't conform to a template that has been tried and tested because there's no proof that it will work again and again. But we do look for a, s a, a remarkable gesture in the center of the film around which we can build the film and it will have its own resonance, its own logic, its own integrity, and will be contagious to life enhancing to an audience. Those are my criteria for choosing scripts. Um, if the script is life enhancing, if, if it's going to be filmed in a manner that is appropriate to the material 
And if we can invite people to sit for two hours or more uh, and, and watch it and be gratified by the process, I think that because of, as, uh, as the, last, uh, the question before last stated, um, the number of outlets now are multiplying overnight. I think that there is, especially with, with, with short, uh, filmmakers who are being sponsored by great companies and brands to make a nine minute or 12 minute film, the ideas are becoming really exciting uh, and, and, and radical and, and um, I'm seeing some very fresh new thrilling ideas. Even though the screenplay might be set in the 90s, the, 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 the retrospective look at that period of history is very exciting and refreshing and new. So I, I think that um, we are seeing a, a, a great generation of filmmakers who are throwing away the formula um, like a commodity and bringing something new and enthralling and entertaining to our audiences. Uh, that's it. That's all the time we have. Uh, Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you.